Commercial conversions and developments. Who here is doing at the moment commercial conversions and developments? Just so I can get a feel. Okay, so about half a dozen of you. Who wants to do them? And who's considering, mildly interested? Okay, good. Okay, well hopefully there's something, uh, something for everybody here. Um, my background, as you know, is, is 30 years of, of running businesses. Um, and that's what commercial conversions and developments are. And I'll show you why they are and how they are. So what you don't get with me, you don't get any fist pump, fist pump, rah, rah, rah. I don't do that. You can go and get your motivation elsewhere. I'll show you how to properly address and approach commercial conversions, okay? There's, there's, the stakes are high, the rewards are high, but there are risks involved. So I think it's only pragmatic to share those with you and identify how, how one of the approaches might be appropriate for you. So, are developments achievable for you? So what do, what do I think about developments? Well, I'm a little bit biased because I've been doing these for, in one form or another for nearly 30 years. But they provide massive leverage, massive. Who here has ever got an invoice on their HMOs from a builder from his kitchen table at about 10 o'clock in the evening and he wants to be paid that night or first thing tomorrow morning? Has that happened to anybody? Well, as to me, yeah. You're going to be dealing with, when you've got small contracts, you're going to be dealing with small contractors. And small contractors don't really like signing contracts at all. They prefer to put a spit and a handshake, and that's, that's what they're used to, to working on. With the leverage, you can get massive contract value, and you can get massive assurance. And we'll come to the reasons why you need that assurance in commercial conversions. And it's maybe not the reason why you think. Okay, so leverage, the returns can be incredibly high. The time to do them, there's a lot of time required for commercial conversions, but because of leverage, it doesn't have to be yours. There are different entry points, okay? You don't have to be all things to all people. I work with people who are introducers of, of funding. I work with funders, I work with banks, all the stakeholders, and there are different parts to play. So you don't have to be the developer to be involved in commercial conversions and developments. So you can choose your strategy or alignment very carefully. And it gives me the opportunity to follow that passion of mine of creating multiple shared value in a, in a huge variety of manners to a wide plethora of parties. So personally, I believe that commercial conversions are achievable for most people. Okay, but it has to be done in a considered way. A bit like I was mentioning with pensions <coughs> earlier on. Be very irresponsible of me to say it's right for everybody. Okay, that stuff sells courses. Okay, it's got to be right for you and you've got to have the right appetite um, for this. They can be hard work, but actually very, very fulfilling. Do you want to see one? Mm -hmm. This is one of ours. This is in Colchester. Somebody asked me earlier on, how do you find your developments? I told them to wait until after the break, and I'll tell you. Um, this one in particular, almost all of our developments um, come off market. Okay, I find if they're on market, to be quite frank, every one of you knows about it, and you'll be trying to outbid me and um, raising the price. Okay, so every one of ours is pretty much off market. So we'll find, uh, find out about it from agents before generally the market does. And I say generally, there'll be a small proportion of local developers who they trust. And we'll come to the reasons why in a bit. This is Oak House in Colchester. My business partner went for a haircut. Nigel lives near Colchester, went for a haircut and literally was walking past this building and there's a guy on some step ladders screwing a commercial agent's board on the wall. And being a fine upstanding citizen, Nigel stopped him and said, what are you doing on step ladders? Have you got a risk assessment? No, he didn't. Um, he said, is that going on the market? Oh. Um, and it was, it was going on the market the next day. So he got, he got the number from the guy, phoned the agent, said, look, any chance of having a look at that? 
So he had a look at the, uh, went to have his hair cut, called the agent while he was in the chair, and within a couple of hours, um, he'd got into the building, met the agent, and to cut a long story short, um, we secured that building that afternoon. That's how quick sometimes you have to work. Okay, and we, co we converted that one, um, and it never went on to market, so nobody else was aware it was there. So that was eight and a half thousand square foot, B1A office, Anybody heard of permitted development? Yeah, so B1A applies to permitted development. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, converted to C3 residential. We got this on an exchange with a delayed completion. Gave us a little bit more time so that we could take a, uh, a reasonably minor calculated risk um, of uh, taking the permitted development of eight two bed apartments to 16 one beds. Okay, so it had permitted it had permitted development rights for eight two beds, and we got uh, we then uplifted it. Does anybody know how long it takes to get permitted development? Two months. Fifty six days. So about, about fifty six days. We got permitted development in forty five days on this one. Colchester were very embracing. We could have taken the lid off and put another roof on. But in um, consultation with the planners, they were absolutely against this. This is in the Dutch Quarter in Colchester, um, and that would have been a fierce battle. Now, there's no problem with fierce battles with, with planners, but you've just got to decide what game you're in and what game you're not in. Okay, the game we're in is buy, develop, sell, recycle our capital, move on to the next development. What we don't want to do is hold, hold our stock for long periods of time. That's it at the moment. Okay. The other, the other image was a, a CGI, computer-generated uh, image. So this is it at the moment. Um, windows are now in. Um, minor remedial work on the outside, um, and that will be 16 one-bed apartments. They're going on the market with help to buy scheme in about four days, probably Monday. Plasterboards up, cracking. Okay, so that will be around about. So we exchanged on that one. It exchanged uh, Christmas last year. Delayed completion of six months. We then finally legally completed in June at the request of the vendor. Completed in June, and we will finish in February. Um, out of those 16 apartments, we've already got expressions of interest from 90 local people. That won't necessarily mean 90, 90 sales or 90 offers, um, but it's a particularly healthy, buoyant market. Does that look a professionally run site? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do things right, okay? You're not gonna save a great deal by just putting eight by four sheets of plywood up, okay? Your brand, your reputation is absolutely everything, everything you do. We made a conscious decision not to brand Equigroup. There are various risks associated with construction. It could be the local scaffold truck pulls up and damages a local car. We don't want our brand soiled during the construction phase. So we allow the main contractor to put very responsible uh, imagery on there, but be careful of your brand. Don't just go out there branding absolutely everything. Just be very conscious of the risk and re reward, the ROI of marketing. Does that make sense? Just picking up on a few things here. Just be savvy. Economics, somebody said, will you run through some numbers? Well, yes, but briefly, because I've got a whole stack of slides for you. So GDV is about 2.6, 2.6, 2.7 million. Um, we're going to split the freehold, so there's going to be 1,625 year leases. Um, we're also going, to, we've got a limited amount of car parking, so that'll be sold on a first come, first served basis. Purchase price was 900,000. Uh, refurb about 830. We've got other whole cost, planning costs, stamp duty, professional fees. Uh, 205, we've got some funding costs, and then we've got a cost of, of sale as well. Solicitors, title splitting, agents, that sort of thing. Um, so 
a healthy chunk of profit. Now, I will not give you, and sorry to disappoint you, I won't give you a three-step system to earning a million quid in a fortnight. The door's there, you can leave. Okay, things take a while and your due diligence has to be spot on and accurate. It's called bank grade due diligence for a reason. If your due diligence isn't bank grade, you'll have spent a lot of time doing your due diligence before the bank grade due diligence really kicks in by others. So you better learn how to do it right first time, right at the front end. That would be my sincere recommendation to you. And it's perfectly possible. This is the, just to complete the picture, this is the marketing brochure. Um, just gives you an idea of, of the inside of the premises. Doesn't quite look like that at the moment with a plasterboard going up. Um, but with the help of CGI's we can really create you know, great imagery which helps how we sell our, our apartments. Got the, the layouts and all the square meterage. Help to buy scheme here. I might touch on that a little later. <coughs> So who, who are we as a business? Well, look, top line's vanity. I see lots of Facebook group people want to be turning over a billion, a quarter of a billion, a hundred million. I don't care, go knock yourselves out, that's great. It'll be a number that's relevant to you. Have you noticed how everybody's grass is greener on the other side? Yeah, and that can be quite intimidating for people who are starting. Okay. We've taken many years to build a strong pipeline. Not every part of that pipeline will materialise, it really won't. So please, if you're just starting off in this industry, don't be intimidated by numbers. You create your own vision. If your own vision is 100,000 or a million or half a million, it'll be what it'll be. And you hold that precious to yourself because that's the most important thing in this whole equation. And that's you and your goals. And they should not compete with anybody else's, in my humble opinion. So we've got some significant growth and our contribution back is through, through Equilife and, and Young Entrepreneur. But we have to be sustainable and sustainability to, comes through property, through business with us in firstly creating shared value. If you can't create shared value, you'll squeeze the pips out of one development but then nobody will want to work with you on the second one. Okay, so leave something in it for other parties. Okay, you don't want to take the lowest price contractor every time. Okay, what you want is the lowest final account potential of any contractor. Because do builders have a habit of sometimes spending a bit more and going over time? You know, you've got to build contingency and understand what risk looks like in all its, all its glorious forms. People, planet and profit. Okay, actually I, I care about the environment. I don't go and hug trees every night, but I've got four kids. I really care about the environment that they're going to be in. And I have a chance to reshape the environment. After all, in commercial conversions and developments, we repurpose and we regenerate assets. That's what we do. So we have to anticipate, that word again, we have to anticipate the market moving forward. And we have to understand how we can take existing asset classes, maybe even land, and how we can repurpose to serve a greater purpose for greater returns. And here's a book for you. I don't think you'll have ever heard of this book unless you've been to PPM Brooklands. Um, I'd like you to write this down if you would. It's by a, a German economist back in the 50s and 60s um, called E. F. Schumacher. It's called Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered. That's a really powerful book. And you just think the resonance, you don't have to look much beyond that, that chapter, okay? You don't have to have a bayonet on the end of your, your, your various um, appendages to, to, to really make an impact in this world. So I'm gonna give you tonight um, just the way we stage our roadmap, okay? This is humbly yours. We've structured this over, over many years and it's, you'll be relieved to know it's not three steps. It's actually a, about a dozen steps. Clearly it starts with you and your strategy. 
You can do the motivational back rubbing and fist pumping on your own later on, I'll leave you to that. Um, and you will know your own strategy and know what those options are. And some of you may actually be for coming to terms with maybe you don't know what that is. So there'll be a few points that I'll leave you to ponder a little bit later on this evening on that. But the, it's the areas around here, these are the pieces of the jigsaw which will bind your strategy together and give you a purpose and a structure and a system to follow. So it will be how you find the sites, your due diligence, um, your approach to planning, again see that as your approach to risk, the valuation process, funding. How we structure commercial funding, commercial and development finance, whole different world. Private investment as well. Economics. The completion. I'm talking about legal completion there. That gets you over the start line. I'm operating this as a business, okay? There are significant fiduciary responsibilities of being a director of a company. Who's a director of a company here? It's no small task, is it? There are responsibilities there. Is it within everybody's grasp? Absolutely. But there's a basic framework to follow, and the information's out there. Okay, it's a serious obligation, and pretty much every hand went up in the room, and congratulations there. You know, it's, a, it's a phenomenal achievement to want to be a director and want to be in control of, of your destiny, but it comes with accountability and a serious duty of care, ones that are matched only with the obligations to society and to your private investors and, uh, and, and institutional funders. Then there's a construction process, and then your exits. Now I've gone through purposely in that order, but just putting you and your strategy to one side, you could argue that actually you start with your exit, and I always encourage you to start with the end in mind. Start with what your exit looks like, because only then will you start to understand what stock, what area are you going to start finding and accessing um, your, your potential. So this is an economic equation. This is business. Business is there to make money sustainably. There are risks, absolutely. Are those risks manageable? Absolutely. Are you going to mitigate all those risks? No. Can you transfer a whole lot of them? Absolutely yes you can. And then there's returns. Has anybody heard the term risk adjusted returns? It's a banking phrase, it's an investment phrase at corporate level, please remember that. Okay, you'll look at your empirical returns and you'll think they're absolutely incredible, fantastic. Blend those with the risk, you will always have risk and in effect what I'm saying is if your potential profits here, add your risk and you'll, you'll consciously bring your expectations down you'll bring contingency into play. Contingency in terms of uh, on your bill costs, on your professional fees, on time, which means you're putting more time in than you think you'll need, just for uh, the what if factor. Okay, under promise, over deliver in everything you do. Believe me, your private investors will thank you. What they won't thank you for is if you've run the hard numbers all the way through and you fall short at the end and you then have a very awkward conversation. So when we talk about things like, well you will, you'll never hear me use the, some of the terms, um, which I believe are quite disrespectful to be honest. Um, we, who here has uh, borrowed money in one form or another from a private investor? Do you think any one of those private investors would like you to term it no money down? Okay. When you take that loan on, the duty of care that you have to that private investor is incredibly powerful. And that accountability I would ask you to, to take very close to your heart. It may not be your own money, but it's pretty damn close. So, it's a business mindset. <coughs> and these are some of the values in creating shared value. These are the parties, the stakeholders if you like, and you add this up in your own mind. Okay, most people think of themselves. 
but we've got the vent I'll assume you can read actually so I won't repeat them all but you know vendors contractors your commercial agents your own team suppliers neighbors society at large